Today I have Eli Facenda, a credit and travel expert who in the past 12 months has helped his clients save over $5 million in luxury travel all around the world. For clients, is usually a trigger event for us is they're coming in, they're like, I got 3 million points and I got a big trip, a trip what can I do? Up. And I'm like, let's get you going, man. And we're getting like a $20,000 first class trip within like the first couple of weeks. Nice. And in this podcast, we walk through some pretty incredible things, such as how he was able to status hack his way into spending $300 and staying at a $30,000 a night hotel in New York City. Some of the biggest mistakes he sees entrepreneurs make whenever they're spending money on their credit cards and how they can leverage those credit cards to get three, five, even 10 times points back than they're currently getting. And finally, if you stick around until the end, I'm gonna break down what his main acquisition channel is and some adjustments that we did live on that podcast so it can be more profitable. Hope you enjoy. Tell me what is one decision that you've made that has made all other decisions in your business easier? I would say something, but the camera's already rolling. I don't necessarily want to sell the business, but I realized if it's built on me, that is a cap and a limitation. So now it's about building systems. Many business owners are managing their own companies when they could establish their own additional company that's called a management company. Investing in myself so that I can decide in what order I should be doing things. All right, Eli, I ask everybody the exact same question first thing when they come on here. What was one of the simplest things that you've put in place inside of your business that has made everything else so much easier? So I would say the thing that gave me the most leverage, the one thing in that sense that created everything else to be, become really simple is investing into mentors and, and programs. And the first piece before that is honestly kind of a self-plug about what we're going to be talking about was figuring out the credit game. Because when I was first starting out, you know, I was risk averse. I had a kind of a nine to five at the time. I was more of an entrepreneur. And I didn't really have the cash to go like invest in a program. I definitely didn't have the time to start something on the side. And so I was trying to figure out like, how do I actually make this happen? And figuring out credit was what enabled me to be like, okay, I can take a little bit of risk at a 0% interest rate, invest into a program and start to learn some of the skill sets. So I think learning that that skill set was the biggest game changer for me. It also opened up the ability to go travel and go to events and conferences, meet other entrepreneurs, change my environment and change what I thought was possible. Um, but ultimately, credit to me is about what can you do with it? Like how do you actually use the leverage and investing into mentorships, programs, coaches, stuff like that. When I joined Scaling Systems, that was a game changer. Um, so a little bit of a long winded answer, but I would say that was the skill set. But really what I did with that was put it into courses, programs, coaches, mentors. There's a catalyst that typically made you do that. So like, first of all, what was your relationship with credit maybe pre the 0% thing? Was it sure. like, oh, don't touch it, don't open it, and you were afraid of it, and then like you learned about it, and then you learned how to invest it? But like, what, what was that turning point for you that you were like, oh, credit's not a bad thing, and maybe I can use it to grow my business and my yeah, life? Yeah, so basically right out of college, I had started this international sports tour company, still part own it. We take youth sports teams on international tours. So we were spending a lot on credit cards. And um, again, I was like an entrepreneur. I was like a number two. I was the first full-time employee. And I wanted to get equity. And so I was looking for ways to actually add value to the company. And we, I wasn't making much yet. And I wanted to basically be able to travel myself. And I'd heard about credit card points. And I was like, shit, if we're spending a lot and I want to travel, like this makes sense as something to figure out because I can add value to the company, potentially get equity. I can use it for myself. And so that was when I started to have this like intrigue to be like, I should figure this thing out because there's a lot here. And I'd heard someone talk about on a podcast before podcasts were cool, <laughs> like 2014 about like this travel hacking thing. And I was like, that sounds dope. Let me figure that out. So that was the initial driver for me. And then I just had my first free uh, trip. And when I had that, I was like, okay, you're hooked. I'm hooked. Like yeah. I'm making 30K, whatever, base a year. And I got on a flight that was like a $7,000 first class flight to London. Oh my God. I paid $6 and I was like, this is a quarter of my salary. <laughs> and I got it off of a credit card sign up bonus. Oh and my so God. And so at that point I was like, I gotta, I gotta do this. So, so, so I almost never talk about people's like come up stories yeah. on this podcast only because like, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts and the sure. people that we like typically listen to this stuff, you know, they know that, that like, you know, the sob story rags to riches, yeah. but you know, I, I we were even talking about you. I just came back from Cabo. We were even talking about you in Cabo as well because I know you're doing the event in the French Alps. I think yeah. in a few weeks, so yeah, we're yeah. talking about some guys going to that. And uh, I, I like I can't help but remember when you first came to Scaling with Systems, where you were at mentally, where you were at in your business, and then like to transition into like this full time, literally traveling, uh, like 
the world, like celebrity in this space. It's just been such an interesting journey to see it firsthand on my part. And you're genuinely one of the like nicest guys I've ever met. So I think I think you deserve all of it for sure. But like just for people that are listening in right now, you know, when you first came to work with us at Scaling Systems, what business were you running? What was the problems? Like where were you at? And then kind of compare that and contrast that to like where you are right now. Yeah. So at that point I was still full time in the tour company mm -hmm. and we were trying to scale it. And I was grind man, dude, I was working so hard in this business. And it's a great company. I still love it. Um, and there's a lot of value in it. And I think what it does is, is incredible. But when it comes to effort in and results out, it's a much more difficult business. And you start breaking down some of these business models where it's like, I forget how you frame it, but it's Good, like gruesome. gruesome. Yep. Yeah. And I was like, shit. <laughs> We're a gruesome yeah, business. Yeah. And it, there's nothing wrong with that if you're if you want to sign up for that. Yeah. I think like if you want to play the 30 year game, which part of me does, and that's why I'm still involved because I believe in the legacy and the mission of it, that's great. But if you want to play a game where it's like, hey, there's leverage and there's the ability to scale something and create an amazing lifestyle, there's better models out there. And it's kind of funny, and I, I sometimes hate admitting this, but what initially was like, dude, I need to do this online business thing was I was working my ass off. I think I'm a fairly intelligent guy. I'm not like the smartest person in the world, but I was like, okay, I can figure some shit out. And I would see people that I would look at and be like, great person, not intelligent, <laughs> 50K a month. And I'm like, you're 23, I hate you. You know, I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. And so I was like, if this person can do it, I saw enough of those where I was like, if these people can do it, I have to be able to do it. So I came yeah. to Scaling Systems and I had this skill set of, of travel hacking points. And I just like, I had tried monetizing it before. Uh, I didn't have a lot of time. And that was one of the appeals was like, okay, there's a, a VA involved and stuff like that. And I can create leverage on my time. Um, and I really wanted to basically figure out how to create an online business. But I was like, no one's going to pay for this. I just had bad beliefs around, um, really around the, the model. And it was mainly because I realized it was who I was talking to. I was getting feedback from my friends. I was getting feedback from my family. I wasn't talking to my ideal avatar that I work with now, which is mostly at least multiple six, but generally seven to eight, sometimes nine figure business owners who would pay for something like this, right? And so I was getting feedback from the wrong people. So I thought I didn't have a business. And then I went into scaling systems being like open-minded. I was like, okay, well, if it's not gonna be that, maybe I'll start a lead generation business because that was hot and seemed easy. <laughs> and I was like, hold on. And then I ended up coming full circle to this. And then we worked through some stuff and um, took a little while to get traction. But then, uh, yeah, it took off. And, and how many roughly out of the 52 weeks of year, how many of it are you like traveling, living remotely? Um, the longest I was at home last year was for five weeks. Wow. So I would say I'm gone about 50% of the time and I'm scaling that back a little bit. And the goal is to take less trips that are like longer and slower and, and have that be kind of the, the, the operating mode. I want to take like one big trip a quarter. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, last year was, was crazy. I mean, I think it was like 60 plus flights, um, hundred plus nights in a hotel, is it was a lot of travel. Yeah, it's yeah. nuts just to see that contrast from where you were before. I think you were like in Chicago, peak COVID, like, you know, lockdown, like, and then to where you're at right now has been um it's been nuts to watch that journey. And you said a few really cool things I kind of wanted to touch on here a little bit. The first thing you talked about was leverage, which like, you know, I would say end of 2022, beginning of 2023, that's like my word, right? I like is leverage. And I've used leverage in all areas of my life, but you know, I think you reach a certain point in your business and in your life and you think like this is all the leverage that I can get, but there's always more layers of leverage there, which is like a challenge that I'm trying to figure out myself uh, even. Like even the, some of the small things I'm doing that I don't still need to be doing yet. And uh, and you realize that you were in a gruesome business model. You couldn't really apply a lot of leverage. You know, I was writing a, a sales letter uh, this morning and it's like hand-to-hand -hand combat a little bit. Like that's really what I see some of these businesses, uh, some of the way people are doing business, like literally hand-to-hand -hand combat to get every single sale, where now, for example, you've applied leverage even with your content, right? You have epic content online, and I'm sure you get a lot of inbound requests from that content. It took you one time to make that content, and then now you get inbound requests from it consistently, right? So that's a an awesome form of leverage. And um, the other thing you said is, this is probably kills more businesses than I think anything else. And I'm not going to do the like typical, oh, don't listen to your parents thing. But it's just, it's it's uh, false negatives when you're trying to launch a product or a service. So, and a false negative is you take your concept or idea and you go out to your direct inner circle because that's the people you know, like, and trust, right? And you say, I'm thinking of doing this idea. And they either give you false positives or false negatives. False positive is like, Eli, that's an amazing idea. I think that would be great. Yeah, you should definitely do that. 
And they're like, great. All right, you want to sign up? It's three thousand dollars. Oh well, you know, I, I don't know if I can. Aff- I, you know, you can find somebody else. I'm not. So that's a false positive. And then the second side of things is the false negative, which is like, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing this thing, and they go, Eli, you should really stick with the tour business. You know what I mean? And like you said, they just weren't your ideal avatar. So, like when you were having that first conversation, w- how did you? Just for people listening to this, how did you start? Like, first of all, how did you realize you're talking to the wrong people? And then how did you start starting that conversation with the right people before you were like, oh, fuck this. There's no way that anybody's going to pay me money for this. Yeah, it, it took a while, honestly. And I think it was going to some in-person events. And I was just listening to the way other people talked. And I was sharing what I do. And they're like, oh, you should be talking to these people, not those people. And it was just getting that feedback from other people who were further ahead in the game. Honestly, like group calls with skilling systems. I remember hearing that kind of stuff. And uh, it kind of clicked slowly. There was no like epiphany moment for that. Um, but there was definitely... You know, there's a moment where you make your first big sale and you're like, holy shit, I feel like I just didn't do anything. And like, you know, they're getting a lot of value, but it's like, it was so effortless. Sure. And it was just like the right person, the right fit. And it was just so easy. And I was like, I need to figure out more of that. And what was different about this person than all the other people I've been talking to. And it was like, this person's making, you know, half a million dollars a year. It's, and like, it's, wor- it's useful to them. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. like they, they, they have, and also you think about it, especially something, and we're going to get into a bunch of travel hack stuff, which I'm excited about, but like specifically along the lines of like travel hacking, you really need, you don't have to have millions of points, but you do need like to get points. You have to be spending money. Like to be spending money, you typically have to have money and majority of people don't have money. So you <laughs> yeah, know what I mean? yeah, so it's yeah, like, exactly. so you go out there yeah. to the general population right. and then you have a problem asking them for this input. Well, and that was, that was a big part of it, right? Cause initially the appeal of travel hacking, like the messaging is really important because I started up being like, you know, and if I, sol- if I was solving for my past avatar, which is what most of us do, it's the person who doesn't have enough money and they're like trying to find any way to scrounge their way into traveling. And that's not someone who's going to be a buyer. And if they are, they're probably a pain in the ass. Yeah. And so that was a big shift too, was trying to basically move away from solving necessarily for my, the, the problem I had for my past self, but solving the same problem, but for someone that has it on a larger scale. Um, and so that was interesting too, because, you know, you get into a lot of uh, programs and stuff like that. You, you guys didn't really take us this way, but there's a lot of times where it's going to be more like you have to find your past version of yourself yeah. and solve for them, where that wasn't really the case for me, but it was the same problem. Right. And so that was a big difference maker for me too. So kind of walk me through, because I want to, I love talking about the business side of things. Like walk us through what is the offer right now? Like yeah. what do you do for people? Mm-hmm. And then kind of walk me through the iterations of that offer. Like what was it previously? Because even scaling the systems from when you joined, I don't know, a year and a half ago or something two-ish, like that, two years yeah, ago yeah. to where it is today, it's like totally different, right? Yeah. We're always iterating on it and making it better, making it more appealing, shortening the time, sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera. So like, why don't you kind of do it in the reverse order? Where are you at right now? What is exactly mm-hmm. the offer? And then like walk us backwards to like, what were the lessons you learned to get to that point where you're sure. today? Yeah, so our main offer is called the business class CEO. And then we have a, a higher tier offer, which is called the first class CEO. Uh, business class CEO is basically for- Great naming conventions. I right? like that. Yeah, That's cool. Exactly, That's a exactly. good naming convention. Yeah, but we were thinking about like, what do we do for below that? We can't make it the economy <laughs> class. Like no one wants that. Yeah, economy yeah. class CEO. The, uh, this is the <laughs> row 31D <laughs> by the toilet program. This is great. Um, no, so basically, business class CEO is for entrepreneurs who are spending ideally at least 30K a month. Uh, they're traveling somewhat frequently or they want to take a few big international trips. And what we're going to do is we're going to help really on two main sides of maximizing their credit. So we're going to make sure that they're earning and maximizing the right points. So there's a couple different steps to that, right? And we basically are putting together a custom card strategy for each client. So this is a done for you service in that sense. So they're coming in, they're getting cards laid out for them, specific order sequences. And we're literally going line item by line item on their annual spend summaries and maximizing every single dollar spent. Because when you have that much velocity of spend, especially some of our clients are spending multiple hundreds of thousands, you make a 2% shift on someone spending $3 million a year. That's a big number. So you're like, okay, uh, you, you're spending a lot of money on advertising here, get this credit card, and just use those for ads. You're doing a lot of money on groceries here, get this credit card and use groceries, yeah, right? exactly. Okay. So literally, we'll give them a whole dashboard of the spreadsheet, quantifying all these items and how much they're spending on categories. Because certain cards like... The MX Business Gold is going to get you 4X on ads, spend up to 150K. After 150K, what do you do? A lot of people are spending 100K a month on ads. Sure. Right, and then you can get another card, and then what do you do after that? So we're sequencing all of these to literally maximize every single dollar, and then including points and status and making sure that the points they're earning are valuable for them. Like, you live in Miami. It's an American Airlines hub. You should have executive platinum status with with American. doesn't do you as good to have, you know, um, top stats with United, for example, because you're just in a different hub. Sure. So it's all kind of custom tailored to that. Where are you traveling? Some people have family overseas. They're flying back and forth to Dubai a lot. All right, so aligning with Emirates would make sense. So we're customizing everything for that. The second end is now you have all these points and you have status. How do you actually use it? 
And so we have on the business class CEO program, basically a done with you. It's more of a, it's a done with you slash done for you in the sense that you get access to our team one-on-one. So you have a calendar, uh, you can just book a call with our points advisor team and they're going to map out about 90% of what you need to do for a trip. Or you can have a request where you basically will say, Hey, I have 2 million points. I need to go home to India for two weeks or whatever it is. We're visiting my grandma and I want you to just plan it all out for me and we'll do it. So you'll plan the trip itself? We'll map out all the flights and hotels Got and it. point redemptions for Very them. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, exactly. Cool. We're not booking it because we're not logging into people's Amex accounts because sure. that's just too much liability. Too much. But we're going to find, be, basically be able to find like, hey, this Emirates flight or this Singapore Airlines flight or this United flight has availability with points and it's going to cost you one-tenth of what it would cost in the Amex portal. So that's kind of like, if you were to compare this to investing in a hedge fund, right? You're basically like, well, why wouldn't I just put my money in the S&P? It's like, oh, well, a hedge fund, you can get you X Higher return return over that. So for us, the version of that is like the Amex portal, right? Most people are going to Amex travel and they're going to use their points and get one cent per point. So it's like, how much are we able to outpace that as your best alternative? So because you're going to log into like different, so what, how do you do that? How do you beat the Amex portal of one cent a point? Sure. So it has to do with how the whole system is set up. So all these banks, well, there's really four main ones, Amex, Chase, Capital One, and City, and they partner with different airlines and hotel programs. And they all have different um, airline and hotel partners. And then on the airline side, those airlines are a part of alliances, right? And so let's say we were going to fly Lufthansa first class back from Frankfurt. Actually, I came to the Scaling Assistance event. I came back from Europe on that exact flight from Frankfurt to Miami. We first class, you get driven onto uh, the tarmac in a Porsche from the lounge. My dad did that, yeah. He did that? that? Okay, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's incredible. And uh, so for that one, right, they're in Star Alliance, but you can't convert any Amex points into Lufthansa directly. Okay. They don't have a partner. But they partner with Avianca. They partner, Amex partners with Avianca, partners with Air Canada, and, uh, you know, Chase partners with United. So if you have those points, you could then book a Lufthansa first class ticket, assuming you can find the availability for it, for, again, about 5 to 10% of the amount of points that the Amex portal will charge. Five to ten percent of the total amount of points. Yeah. So, so like, if, if, if it's a hundred points on Amex, just for easy numbers, it would be ten points on wherever you're talking about right now. And is that through Lufthansa? That's through one of their partners, because again, you can't convert Amex into Lufthansa. Ah. So that's where like you, I used Avianca for that. But even this is where things get crazy, and why it makes sense to just get help for this stuff. Sure. Um, is because so even converting your Amex points into Air Canada or Avianca, even those will price a Lufthansa flight differently, even though they're all part of the same alliance. So. I just, for that flight example, I think it was something like, you know, if I was going to use the Amex portal, it was like almost 800,000 points. Okay. If I was going to use um, Avianca, it was like 67,000, right? So saving like over 730,000 or whatever. And then if I was going to use Air Canada, it was like 110,000. So even the difference between those two airlines was still 40,000 points. Yeah. And, uh, and that's how the whole thing works. But that's what our team is doing for people. We know all this stuff, the nuances, the rules that are changing and stuff like that. So you say, I got a trip. We're going to map all that out. Now, to you, it seems seamless. And you're like, cool, what happened? But we're like searching we're all these different sites different. and running all these kind of and, and are you, uh, is it like a 12-month thing? Is it like a six-month thing? What does that look uh, like? Yeah, so basically when you come on, you get um, three months included. Okay. So there's the upfront, there's the onboarding, there's a couple one-on-one -on -one calls, the strategy, and then you get access to our weekly group call. You get direct email support. You get calendar access. And we also send out dream trip alerts. So we'll prepackage like a forty thousand dollar dream trip for two to Japan and Thailand or to the Middle East, or whatever. We're gonna find all the dates and availability in hotels. We send out to our client base, and they can just book it on the spot. If they I want. love that. That's so, cool. What a great. That's a great offer. Super fun. Super you scalable should, too. You yeah. should also uh, consider. Can I give you a piece of advice? Yeah, please. But you should also consider. Um, so, for example, I had an executive assistant running uh, all of my travel and everything. Yep. And you can give view only access and points only access to Amex and Chase. Mm -hmm. So, like, sure, it's a little bit more cost on your end to get that. But if you did that in the onboarding form, like, if I could literally, like, like having an EA, if I could literally just show up at the airport mm -hmm. and it was already booked, I would say that's like a 10 times increase in value for maybe a two times increase in cost or complexity for you guys. That's true. That's true. That is, that is interesting. And I'll, I'll kind of share the other, slightly on the other program. Yeah. We kind of solve a little bit for that. Okay. Um, but but to answer your initial question, so it's three months up front. Okay. And then after that, it's $200 monthly to continue to get access to our team, to get the email access, the dream trips, and all that. And the group cool. Calls and what's the community that. hosted on? Slack or? Uh, yeah. So we use Slack and we use Thinkific. Okay. basically our main platform. And we nice. have a Facebook group. But um, yeah, there's multiple access points, right? So you have email and stuff like that too. Okay. Cool. Um the first class CEO program is similar to what you said, and that's where if you have an EA, we're going to train them on how to do it all for the business owner. And for us, we we looked at it and we thought, okay, this is a little bit more scalable because it's more of a coaching program for us, but then the business owner gets a done-for-you solution. 
They get to show up at the airport and their assistant knows how to handle everything. It's Saturday at 11 p.m. They have an issue. They can call their assistant. They're not calling our team. Got it. Right. So we're basically removing ourselves from the bottleneck in that, but they're still getting the outcome they want just via that assistant. And that's a group coaching program, but there is one-on-one -on -one training involved. And the client still gets that custom card strategy and direct access to our team as well. What's the split on the sales of the, the business class and the first class? It's about 80% business class. Okay. Just because the, the niche of people for how many people have an executive assistant that are spending enough and traveling enough is much smaller. Yeah. Um, at least what we've tapped into so far, I'm sure there is a much wider, wider. audience for that than we've than we've why not just into. why not just focus only on the business one and then just have the EA go in through the business one? Uh it's a good question. We could the the challenge with it is like the business class CEO requires very little knowledge from the business owner. And if you want your assistant to be able to handle travel well and be able to do this stuff for you, there's a lot of training sure that goes on so that's that's the difference but then aren't you kind of eating into your retention by kind of firing yourself by getting the executive assistant to do it versus them paying the 200 dollars a month we are but it's a much higher ticket yeah so so the, the ticket price is over double okay Hey guys, really quickly, if you're getting value out of this, please be sure to share it wherever you share things. Share it with your friends, your colleagues, your employees, share it to somebody that you know needs to hear this message. We put an incredible amount of work into these videos and these episodes for you. And all I ask in return is for simply to share it to somebody else that wants to hear that or needs to hear this message. All right, let's get back to it. What was the iterations? Like what were some of the things you tried previously that kind of didn't work and why do you think they didn't work? Yeah, so I mean, if we go all the way back to the beginning, you uh, started with the initial like, you want to give me money? Like, I am your slave. Like, <laughs> like, where do you need to go? When do you need to go? Oh, it's 10 p.m. Friday night. Call me. I'll be available. Right. So that, that's where it started. And we have Which is just <laughs> before you can, which is totally fine. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like everybody, I literally was just writing this in this <laughs> asset. Everybody starts that way. Right. Most people literally, the, I think the biggest mistake I hear people go is like, oh, that's not scalable. You did the right thing. You did the not scalable thing first. It's like, who gives a fuck if it's scalable if you have zero clients? That's right. not, having zero clients is not scalable. Right. So you did the right thing in the beginning. And then I'm sure you made iterations yeah, from yeah. that, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I saw the importance of, I need case studies. Yeah. I need like a validated offer. I need people to, at this point, I didn't really have a brand yet, like social media hadn't popped, so like I need credibility. And so um, started there, then went into basically one-on-one -on -one coaching, realized, again, the people that wanted to pay a higher ticket didn't want to learn anything. And um, so then I started figuring out, okay, I need an assistant that can start to help to, to plan travel. And so I started to remove, remove myself from fulfillment a little bit, okay. which was a huge point. And then um, at that point, it basically turned into, you know, people are getting access to my assistant in there, and then uh, via Slack, and then it was like group coaching at that point. So I built a course, there's group coaching. So it was like, you come in, you get access to a course if you want to do that, you get the group coaching calls, but most, most importantly, you're getting access to an assistant on our team who can help plan stuff. And so it was basically a big pricing model uh, shift each kind of iteration along that way. And then eventually around November last year, I was like, okay, now I actually really want to scale this into like a legit business. This is no longer just like a fun little hobby or something like that. And I was like, I need to build a team. November of last year, meaning three months ago? No, like the year before that. The year before that. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Sorry. I forgot we're in 2023 now. <laughs> uh, so I was like, need to build a real team and need to find someone who knows my level of the points game or higher and is reliable. And so I met Tommy. Nice. And it was like a perfect alignment because I had the business goal and drive and desire and some more competency on that side. He has the skill set, the brand, um, and a lot of just like unbelievable knowledge in the points game that this is a niche skill set. Like, sure. Like there's a lot of people that can do it, but the people that can do it well and actually live it, not a lot. And so connected with him and it was like perfect alignment. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I kind of want to, I do want to talk about status a lot because that's probably, I, I know the points pretty well, right? So I have like, I don't know, maybe 4 million points between Amex and Chase. So like we do the points game well, I get the new credit cards. Like status is something I've always like, you know, I think with the platinum card and a few things, I'm like gold status some places. I'm just like the bare minimum of yeah. what you can get out mm -hmm. of it. Like, Talk to me a little bit about like what are some of the benefits of the status game? Like what are some of the cool things that a lot of people don't know? And then like what are some really easy ways to get like higher status? Like because I, I think majority of people, even I, before I got really into travel, didn't even know what status was. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So like what is it? What are some of the main benefits of it? And then like how can some people, like what are some e really easy low-hanging fruit areas that people can increase their status? Sure, it's a great question. And the first thing to talk about with status, the most important thing to understand is that the real benefits only kick in at higher levels. Sure. So like if you have gold status, like it doesn't really do anything. So most people are like, I had status. I didn't really see anything happen. 
because the the mid tier ones or low tier ones just like it's basically like you don't have anything. Really. The, I, the 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 biggest benefit for me uh, when we travel in hotels is I have gold status with Marriott I think or Hilton, mm -hmm. and it is kind of nice that I do get early check in and they yeah. do late checkout as like late as two o'clock or three o'clock in right. the afternoon, which is pretty cool. But yeah. I'm sure like as far as like overall like the cool things that you're about to talk about that's probably nothing but yeah. it's still kind of nice yeah yeah and that's something like honestly you could probably ask for that yeah you could just you ask me to get that in. Like, you're right you're like, right sure they yeah. like to give you a favor yeah. right? now i feel like a piece of shit yeah, 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 yeah. No he's like out. yeah that's yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's cute that's cute um enjoy enjoy your free bottle of water um so what happens with top tier status so a couple different things it depends on hotels and airlines right um uh, so we'll start with hotels so i mean just really consistent upgrades to suites is number one so room upgrades great um, in terms of check-in, check-out, depending on the status you have, like if you have Ambassador Elite, which is the highest one with Marriott, you basically get a room whenever, you can check in or out whenever you want, like any time of the day or night. Wow. So you have a weird overnight flight, doesn't matter. You can just basically do that. You need to stay until later. You get a lot of flexibility there. You get direct access to like concierge numbers and all this stuff. Um, obviously free breakfast. A lot of them have really nice lounges. So you start staying at like Ritz Carlton's. You can get access to, well, there you have to book under a certain floor, but a lot of properties are going to have really nice lounges too at the actual hotel. So better Wi-Fi, free food, like good setup to work in. Usually your room's going to be decent, but that's a really nice perk. Um, a lot of, just a lot of like free amenities come with it, right? They're going to give you like welcome food and drinks and stuff like that. But I would say the biggest thing, like in terms of cost is, and like actual measurable value is getting upgraded to really nice suites, especially if you stay at higher end properties, because the difference between a standard room and a nice room is insane. So I'll give you an example. I just stayed at the Park Hyatt in New York City. Really nice five star hotel. I have global status with Hyatt. Now, this room, I used 40,000 points to get into a room that was around $1,200 a night. So, nice room. This is their standard room. 40,000 points, like just so people that are listening yeah. to this, what does that equal to dollars wise? So, the value of a point is based on how I use it. So, I used it to, so you get to get me $1,200 $1, a night. But generally, if you were going through like the Chase Portal, Airmex Portal, it's worth 400. Got it. Right. So, I got three times the value by converting these points to Hyatt. Very cool. Now, here's the kicker because I have status, I believe this is what happened, but even with status, I generally don't upgrade you this far, but I got upgraded to the presidential suite, wow. which is 30K a night. Wow. And that's a ridiculous upgrade, right? So I used 40,000 points to get a $30,000 a night room. And um, status, at least from what I understand, was the thing that did that. You know, I, I can make requests and sometimes I honor it or not. But getting upgrades to things like that, that's like a lifetime. How baller engine. was the room? Was it pretty cool? It was insane. I mean, you're in midtown Manhattan with a view of Central Park. It's like a 2,400 square foot apartment. Wow. It's crazy. Um, so... That kind of stuff becomes available. Now, on the airline side, you're also going to start to get better access to lounges. Um, so, like, different lounges when you're traveling through the airport. Like, you can go. To, everyone can go to the Centurion Lounge, and now, because it's so easy to access it, it's, like, overcrowded and stuff like that. But if you're going to fly and get access to the American Airlines Flyship Lounge in Miami, that's a totally different experience. Much nicer, way quieter, all that stuff. So, you get better lounge access. You obviously get the free bags and stuff like that. Depending on the tier status you have, if it's, like, lifetime or where you're at, you can get some really cool VIP treatments depending on like where you're at, where they're like driving you on off the tarmac. That's like more exclusive stuff. But uh, again, better phone assistance, um, always getting free bags, more consistent upgrades too. So like I have American ex American Platinum Pro right now, which is their, um, it's not the highest, it's one, one below it. For who? American Airlines. Okay. And uh, I get upgraded like 75 to 80% of the time. So what I do, my strategy is if it's a flight that's like three hours or less, I'll book it in economy and hope to get the upgrade. And if I don't, it's a three-hour flight. It's not the end of the do world. They, do they just automatically upgrade you? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So and it happens like 70% of the time? Yeah, exactly. It depends, again, where you're flying in and out of and how many other people have status in your area. So like Miami, because it is a hub, you're actually less likely to get upgraded out of than out of Austin because there's less people with American status because it's not an American hub. Okay. So part of the game. Um, but what's really cool is actually in the airline industry, this is some fun fact for you. Um, the, the airlines oftentimes make more money off their loyalty programs than they do off of selling seats. So they really value these credit card holders and that way of monetizing in terms of their, their business. And so they're actually shifting a lot of their status benefits, not towards those who travel the most, but those who spend the most. Which, on their credit cards? On their co-branded credit cards. So that is a huge advantage for business owners, right? Because who spends the most? People that are running significant businesses. So to get like uh, executive platinum with American, you have to have 200,000 loyalty points in a year. You can earn a loyalty point from spending a dollar on one of their co-branded cards. So for you, you get one of their American Airlines co-branded cards. You're going to have top status with them within like a month and a half probably. And, and do you, is it, how long does that status last? The whole next year. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. So it would like, if I did it in, right now in January, it would be until January of next yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Yep. So you can get that. Now, certain programs allow you to spend your way there. Hyatt, you can also spend your way to status. You basically have to earn 60 qualifying nights, but you can earn um, five qualifying nights for every 10K spent. 
So if you spend 120K on that card, you get to 60, right? On their co-brand business card. Now you have top status of Hyatt. So now you've just killed two really good statuses. You have a hotel brand that gets you really good status and an airline that gets you good status. Marriott does require some more qualifying nights like staying in their hotels. And then with Hilton, you can actually get, this is the only brand out of any airline or hotel that gives you top status just from holding a card. So they have the Hilton Aspire card, which will just get you their diamond status just from having it. Oh. Which is cool. The downer with that is, again, the easier they make it, the more people have it. Yeah. So the less perks you're going to see, right? So less consistent benefits, at least. Um, so it's still pretty awesome and easy to have because if you're going to stay in Hilton's a few nights a year, worth it, right? You're going to get club lounges. You're going to get breakfast. You're going to get upgrades, all that stuff. And so that's a huge win. Um, it's also really easy to get the value out of the annual fee on that card. But uh, but that's basically going to be how I would plot status if if I were kind of just getting into this is thinking yeah, about so, so what's the highest value, lowest cost status play that people, one or two of them, that people listen to this that they can do? You might have already said it, but just sure. so I can like, well, if someone's listening to this, either let's say they're spending at least $20,000 a month, if that matters yeah. at all. Like, so what is the, this is the bad, most badass thing you can get without a lot of input, either it's time, money, or effort on your part. Sure. I mean, the Hilton Aspire is the fast, the Hilton status is the fastest and easiest. Okay. Um, because it literally just requires you having a credit card. You don't have to spend anything. You don't have to stay in a hotel. So that's, that's. And what, do you know what that gets you like at the actual hotel? Just more consistent upgrades, okay. free breakfast, lounges, early, earlier check-in, late check-out, Welcome gifts. And you'd have to pay the annual fee a year, right? You'd pay the annual like fee. $95 or something? That, I think that card's like four fifty, dollars but, okay. but you get like a bunch of credits. You get like a $200 statement credit. You get a free night. You get sign-up points. So cool. if you use the credits, it's worth like It'll 800 bucks it. at least. Got it. Um, so that's that's the first one. And then I would say the best hotel program in terms of loyalty and points and benefits is Hyatt for sure. Just the way they price their award chart is much better than the other brands. And so if I was spending twenty k a month, I would just put six months of expenses on a Hyatt business card get to 120k in spend, and then you have Hyatt Globalist. And that's that's to me the best hotel brand for um, for people that are just trying to maximize perks and benefits. Their, their upgrades are really consistent. Um, they price things well on points, and they have great customer service. The only downside to Hyatt is that they have less hotels than Marriott and Hilton. Yeah, I actually don't know if I've ever stayed in a Hyatt before. I typically almost always stay in a Marriott or Hilton resort. It's possible that you might have stayed at like one of their brands that's not exactly in the ownership Hyatt. group, yeah, but it's not like called a Hyatt property, yeah. Interesting. Very so very in, cool. in Europe, for example, they have a ton of like boutique hotels that are all uh partnered with Hyatt, but they're not labeled Hyatt at all. So for you, do you like never stay in an Airbnb? You just always do hotels? Worst case scenario, I'm in an Airbnb. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, think about it. So right now I'm in Miami I'm yeah. with the Hyatt Regency. I got upgraded to the Panorama Suite, which is awesome. I got free breakfast, which I didn't eat because I'm intermittent fasting, but <laughs> I got a gym, good Wi-Fi. I'm right next to Whole Foods. So before here, I ran ran over to Whole Foods, super easy. Check in, check out, super easy. They're going to change my bed sheets and all this stuff. So for me, I just think about the the ease. And then there's the benefits of I didn't pay for it, right, at all. And I'm like, now, and you can earn points from staying. So I just look at all the compounding factors of like how many more benefits there are to having a hotel than Airbnb. If you're just like solo traveling or traveling with one other person, that almost always makes sense. For me, if it's a big, like a big group, you know, you're going to a city or country where you don't have a lot of hotel chains. Like Columbia, South America doesn't have a lot of like great um, hotels for redemption. So in that case, it'll make sense. Or you're out in the woods or something like that. Like, sure. Yeah. You're in the mountains. Maybe it makes sense. I but, used to know. be a big Airbnb yeah. person, but I'm like moving more and more. It's honestly, if you just remove costs, it's just convenience, you know, like, it's just like literally when you get somewhere, you don't have to worry about groceries and a chef and mm -hmm. like, you're just like, go in there. There's usually a restaurant in the lobby. You can eat that food. Yeah. They, they almost always have good Wi-Fi. Yeah. The other big factor for Airbnb versus hotels, who are you going to meet? Same yeah, with flying first class versus economy. Like, who are you going to meet when you're in or when you're at the lounge? I've made a lot of business deals. I'm obviously talking about travel, so it's kind of easy because yeah. it comes up a lot. But it doesn't matter who you are. If you're someone that's willing to have a conversation, to strike up a conversation, the people you're going to meet when you're traveling like that, high quality people. Yeah, in terms I, of I met, I met Wiz Khalifa at the Waldorf. Did you really? Well, I didn't necessarily meet him, but I saw him. <laughs> you saw him, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, he's we, probably talking we, to his we, friends. He's like, Ravi up a bottle. Yeah, he was like, oh, shit, I saw that. <laughs> you know, it definitely no, the, is. But the guy I was with, though, he did buy him a bottle uh, of tequila, which was funny because I think somebody else said that he just came out with a new single, which is Never Drinking Again. And my <laughs> buddy bought him a bottle of tequila nice. while we were there. <laughs> nice. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, last year we saw some celebrities as well. Uh, we saw like a few comedians there. But you're right. It's the people you meet also, which I, I guess I never thought of either. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you have the intention of I'm going to meet like one to two amazing people on this trip and you go into it and you start just striking up small conversations can lead to some really fun places. I think that's really a really uh, overlooked way of traveling. That's like part of what for me is fun about travel in its essence is just like there's a lot of mystery, a lot of adventure if you take that approach. It's also easy to like 
lock in and be like, I'm in grad mode as soon as I get to the airport, as soon as I'm on the flight, as soon as I'm in the Uber. Like you can take that and there's times where I do that too. But there's also times where you can be like, who am I going to meet? What's going to happen? I don't know. I'm open to connections and seeing where things go. And then all of a sudden you have like really cool conversations or you hear about a new place. Or it's like, oh shit, I never knew that place even existed. I need to go there now. And so, uh, so that's part of the fun for me is yeah. like, is having that. All right. So let's shift for one more thing. Uh, I want to talk about points for a second because like, I feel like it would be, um, ill-advised if I didn't. So like, person listening to this, like for me, example, for example, like, so, um, I, I could pay you and we, you could do it all for me, but let's say the person listening to this, they want to do it on their own. I don't, you know, the additional points that I could get by doing this and that. And like, you know, at some point, the value of the additional points to the cost of me having to like go through those hoops is no longer worth it. So like for that person, me or somebody else, what are a few really the low hanging fruits that you see on the point side that it's like, look, never uh, get your points on American Express, always buy Delta, go to the Delta website and transfer mm. the points there. What yeah. are a few areas that you're like, because some of these numbers you're saying are really impressive about like, mm-hmm. you know, getting four times the amount of points. And I loved, I want to wrap up talking about the marketing message. I love where you were like beating out like a hedge fund, how you like beat out yeah. the S&P 500, beating out like if you had just done an Amex. So like what are some of you or your teams like SOP or go to when it's like, all right, this person has this many points on on Chase or Amex, like in order to maximize those mm-hmm. points? Yeah, I mean, you're always going to get the best value on long haul international business to first class flights, unless you do the hotel thing I mentioned with the Park Hyatt where you get an upgrade, that's kind of uh, an outlier. But uh, that's always where you're going to get the best bang for your buck, where you're getting 5, 10, sometimes 15 to 20 times the value out of the Amex portal. That's like, that's the game changer. And our goal, like, you know, for in terms of time to value for clients is usually a trigger event for us is they're coming in, they're like, I got 3 million points and I got a big trip. trip What can I do? And I'm like, let's get you going, man. And we're getting like a $20,000 first class trip within like the first couple of weeks. Nice. And that's a huge win because they multiple ROI within a few weeks. And so that's that's for us like super important is like how can we help people that have these big international trips the most? So I would say if you have a lot of points or you're accruing points, save them for the big trips until you're at a certain point, kind of like you're talking about, where there's almost diminishing returns. If you have like three, four, five million points and you don't have an immense amount of travel, or you can also use your points for team employee incentives. So that's a huge thing. Some people will basically send their team members on like best sales rep on like a thirty thousand dollar trip entirely on points. Uh, yeah. <laughs> People that are listening to the podcast didn't yeah. see me look at Jack over there. Yeah, right. And Jack's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's send him on like a, you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar trip. You go over first class to Dubai, stay in a five-star hotel for a week, take your girl with you, whatever. And it costs you nothing, huge value add to them. And so it just depends on the business, right? Because maybe if you're really profitable, you want to reduce expenses. If you're trying to potentially sell, maybe you want to increase profit. So you can think about different strategies there. So I would say after a certain point, there's diminishing returns in terms of earning more points and being able to use them. And that's where it would make sense to use them for less value. But a couple of things you don't want to do. Do not cash out for gift cards or Amazon purchases. Don't do that. <laughs> that's that's rule number one, right? You're just trading something in for way less value than, than it could be. Because at that point, it's like point, it's like a cent, right? Even less. Really? Yeah, it can be like six tenths of a cent sometimes. Oh, wow. So you don't want to do that. Um, ideally, you don't use the Amex travel portal or Chase travel portal unless there's no other options and you just don't want to pay for something. Wow, I just do that every single time. Yeah, it's just, it's just again, you're getting one cent per point where you could be getting- So what's the two, alternative? What, do I, what should I do instead? Convert them to airlines and hotels. So if you have the ability to do that, right? So that's the, the kind of tipping point where it's like, there's a little bit of knowledge that is required for that, you know, because like sometimes it's not available. It's not the same availability that you'll see on Amex Travel. So like, let's say I'm going, so I just booked up, we're having an event in Vail yeah. uh, end of this month mm-hmm. for a scaling initiative. And I just bought like five tickets for our team members. So like I just did it all through Amex Travel, but mm-hmm. like, well, should I have like looked at Amex Travel to see what airlines it was, and then gone on like the airline website and looked up the flight and then transferred it from Amex to that airline? Gotcha. Yeah. So if you wanted to redeem points, that's how you would do it. You would be like, what are the flights? And then you'd look for the point availability on that airline site and say, okay, so if it's Delta, for example, you would look at Delta and be like, what is the cost if I transfer these points from Amex to Delta? That's a one-to-one ratio, and then see that point total versus the point total through Amex Travel. And is it almost always that the Delta one would be less than what it is on Amex? It varies. Okay. Um, each each airline has its own way of pricing, so Delta is not very reliable with that. But like United and American, more reliable. Really? Yeah, it's just like they all have different pricing. Some are what what's called dynamic pricing, where the price and points on the airline will change based on like the cash costs and stuff like that, where others are basically going to price based on the uh, distance or the region you're flying to and from. That's where the arbitrage comes in because the Amex portal is always pricing based off of the cash value. They give you a fixed value in your points, right? So a trip to Dubai, I keep using that example, but that could be, you know, it's a far trip, it's expensive. So on the Amex portal, because of that, they're correlating the points to the to the dollar cost. So that 
that trip might be 1.5 million points, right, for a 15K trip. Well, if you converted those points into Emirates, because it's region A to region B, they only charge 136,000. Oh, wow. So that's that's like the difference you can have. Um, but that's how I would be looking at it. And then if you're buying stuff on cash, you basically, and you're using a business card, going through the Amex travel portal and using your business platinum is actually good because you'll earn more points that way. So there's two ways to earn points when you're buying travel, right? There's the actual flying in the seat and then there's the card you purchase it on, Yeah. right? And so unless you're potentially trying to like get status through spend on a certain co-branded card where it might make sense to say, okay, if I buy this Delta flight on my Delta card because I'm trying to get Delta status, that would be yeah i think like for me on amex i i spend all of my money on the gold but then i'll buy first class uh tickets on my platinum uh, through points because i get 35 percent back i believe whenever yeah. you're doing that and then same thing on chase i just move all my points to my uh chase sapphire or reserve or yeah. whatever it's called mm -hmm. and that's like an addition i think that's like 30 percent, 35 percent back something like that yeah too. so if you're going to use the travel portal that's the way to optimize it Got like it. that's the best value you're going to get so you're doing that right cool that's good that's, uh, that's, yeah, always that's good that's right. a win um and uh, yeah, so that's how you want to do that. For hotels, I don't recommend using the Amex Travel Portal at all, uh, particularly because the way they, they accrue status and stuff like that. So if you book a hotel through what's called an OTA, an online travel agency, which technically Chase Travel and Amex Travel are, but these online travel agencies that partner with, with um, hotels and airlines, if you book a hotel through that, you're not going to earn any elite nights towards status, right? But if you book through the actual hotel, you will. With flights, if you book through the online travel agency, you still will get Points so for that hotel example, would you transfer the points over to that hotel from Amex or Chase? Yeah. Yeah. Or you'd earn those points organically or potentially just like pay cash directly to the hotel. Got it. Yeah. What's the uh, most amount of points that you've heard or seen somebody have? Oh, there's one guy out there. Uh, I know if he's got like 30 million. Alaric Heck, who we just started working with, has... I think 13 million Amex points. Damn. Yeah, he's got a lot of YouTube ads. He, he beats me. Yeah, huh? YouTube ads, man. He must have not. I used to have a lot. I used to have more than, uh, I think I'm at like 3.5 or 4 between both of them. But then I just started fucking, you know, like we do a bunch of team events. Yeah. So now I'm buying all my team members stuff right. on, uh, on the portal. Well, so. there is value to using them because as the game gets, you know, more established in terms of the points game, uh, points get slowly and slowly devalued over time. So Amex points will always be there, but like the the ratio the to convert them, those airline points slowly get more and more inflated. So like Hilton points are worth way less than they were like three years ago because they did like a big devalue and it just has to do with their accounting. They can kind of like give you all these points, right? Yeah. And then overnight just be like, see ya. So it doesn't make sense to hold on to them like forever. Got right? it. To just stack them and never use them. Like you should use them. But ideally you always want to have a little bit of a safety net. You know, so in case you have a sporadic random trip you need to go on, you're, you're good to go. Yeah, so the follow-up yeah. question to that is, what's one of the coolest, like, bang for your buck vacations that either you've gone on or your clients have gone on for such a low amount of money? Like, what's a good mm. destination? What, like, what's that kind of ratio? Okay, I'm going to give you a few. Yeah. So you want to check these out online. You can either check out my Instagram, Tommy's Instagram, or just look them up. Singapore Suites First Class. Okay. Ridiculous experience. You have an entire, it actually turns into a double bed if, if you get two of them next to each other. How long is that flight? Uh, so... It was from JFK to Frankfurt, actually. They fly oh, to Germany. So was that eight hours? Yeah, maybe? it's like eight hours, yeah. um, which I did overnight, which I don't recommend because then you're sleeping. Like, I want to enjoy the whole thing. So. Yeah. Um, but most of them are going to be in and out of Singapore. So that's, Sometimes when I do that kind of stuff, I'm like, like you said, you're sleep, so you're like in the room. I'm like, I don't know. What, I want to try to take advantage of this. Right. As much yeah, as yeah, yeah, like exactly. Clicking every button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, but the my favorite experience was the Emirates A380 first class. Okay. So it's a double-decker plane, and uh, they have a shower. In a bar on board. Wow. And they have, you literally sit down, they're like, so our menu policy is like, it's insane menu. It's like amazing food, Dom Perignon, like high-end drinks and stuff like that. And they'll be like, our policy is whatever you want, whenever you want. So like, we haven't taken off yet. I'm like, can I get like caviar or whatever? And they're like, yeah, sure, we'll bring it out. I'm like, wow, this is unbelievable. So Emirates first class was was incredible. That was from JFK to Dubai. That was the 15K uh, value flight right there that I, that I mentioned. Um, otherwise, I haven't done this yet, but... It's high on my list, and I'll do it soon. Is the Overwater Villas in the Maldives? Oh. So those are really dope. But you can say like the Ritz Carlton um, uh, or the St. Regis; those are good Marriott properties there, which are really good point values. And you're getting unbelievable, like insane rooms. Overwater Villas. If you have status and you get upgraded to like you know a bigger one, you can sometimes have a two bedroom unit that's like a five to six thousand dollar a night hotel over water and just like an incredible view. And the and the the hack there is basically when you book with points through Marriott or Hilton you get what's called a fifth night free. So you book four on points, you get a fifth night free. Oh, cool. So that helps you save even some value there. So that's what I would be doing. Um, so I haven't done that yet, but that's that's high for me. All right, let's shift gears really quickly back into the business side. I want to ask you a few questions. Main way you guys are acquiring clients right now is through what? Uh, organic referrals are huge and then paid ads. 
Interesting. And what is a paid ad funnel? What does that look like? And uh, what are like some of the costs involved in that? Yeah, so basically we're just really simple right now. Um, I am going to be testing and running YouTube ads here soon <clears throat> just because I think the targeting on that is going to be really valuable for what we're doing and having these kind of really specific niches. But uh, it's pretty simple. It's IG story ads go basically to uh, a message. DM. Yep, DM response. And then that brings it to ManyChat. There's a masterclass or some other form of opt-in. And then we have a team member that's basically going to be communicating with clients and setting calls from there. And is a masterclass like a video sales letter? Uh, it's blur it's more like a long uh, like a long form training, but yeah, basically okay. it's like forty five minutes right now. I'm gonna be testing out shorter versions because a lot of our avatar, you know, seven eight figure business owners, they want to sit through a forty five minute training. Yeah, probably not. But um, right you can literally. I was I was writing down a few things. Like uh, first of all, when I, it's funny you said Google. Uh, I wrote down just to tell you afterwards, but I'll just tell you now. Custom intent on YouTube. Yeah, I would probably be running ads for that because you said something earlier. It's just the way my brain works. That a lot of people uh, like you, you can get them a time to value. You can get them win really quickly. Like yo, I have a trip to the Maldives coming up in six weeks. What can you do with all these points? Right. So like if you do custom intent on YouTube, you could say, hey, show me an audience of people that are searching right now you know, a uh, trip to Maldives or trip to all these places and you could show ads exactly to those people on YouTube. Right. So like yeah, that would be a good that's timing. That's like a cheat code, it feels yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. That would be really, really good. And then also on the messaging side, you know, for me, it's like, cool. The difficulty in what your offer is is saying it in one sentence so that a third grader can understand. Mm -hmm. And that's really the only way you can scale on paid advertising. Yeah. So like I was like thinking in my brain, one of the coolest things was like that hedge fund thing. Almost everybody will understand what a hedge fund is. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, maybe if you kind of baked in some kind of guarantee, like we guarantee that uh, we'll get you at least a five times return on your points than what you would have done it on its own, or we'll give you all your money back. Yeah. So, or we'll give you a, uh, a trip free or sure. something along yeah, those yeah, lines. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that, if you can get your statement down to something like that, I think it would be huge for you. That is, yeah, that's really, and that's something I've really been focusing on now is because initially when I was when I was doing a lot of messaging, it was crafting it towards people that weren't problem aware. Yeah. And that is just a disaster for what we're doing because sure. there's too much like, is this too good to be true? This seems like a scam. Like, what's going on here? I'm like, oh my God. So I realized after I looked at all of our past clients, like, who are the people that are buying from us? It's people that have a lot of points and like, dude, this is confusing as shit. Yeah. I know I got a lot of stuff. My buddy is getting all his first class stuff. I don't know what the hell he's doing. I feel like an idiot. Help me out. Yeah. Right. And so that's kind of our core message right now is, is have you been trying to use points and it's kind of confusing? Well, we can help you get five to 10 times more value out of the points you're getting to get first class flights and trips and experiences showing showcasing it. So that's kind of our core message right now with like top of funnel ads and stuff. But I think trying out what you were saying with like the hedge fund version. Could yeah, be like or we guarantee we'll beat you. We'll beat this. Are you have a trip coming up? We guarantee you we'll get you four times uh, more value than what right. you would have done if you did it on your own. Right. Because like that's very simple to say. And when you say that you have a master class, a lot of times, and this is just even what I used to do as well, when you have to have a lot of educating and nurturing content is because you haven't worked hard enough to make your offer mm. very simple and easy to understand from the yeah. very beginning. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like we used to have uh, one hour, two hour long video sales letters and webinars. I have a nine minute one that's converting incredibly well for us just because cool. I'm just like, we'll build you, build you an end-to-end -end marketing system in three days or you don't pay. That's like the end. Right. Right. That's the whole thing. Right. So if you can figure out a tagline like that, I think you'll crush the ads yeah. side of things. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 I know Alaric does the YouTube ads beat Facebook ads every single time. Yeah. I need to do that. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Airline whatever beat. Yeah. That <laughs> would be, that would be great time. to do it. Yeah. And yeah. that's a good lesson for everyone listening yeah. to this as well. It's like boiling it down to literally like 10 to 12 words uh, is huge. There's a great little uh, free software called the Hemingway app. And it like tells you your... Um, your the reading level of the words that you're using. And so if you can bring it, take something big and then just keep on trimming it down to one sentence and then put it on like a third to fifth grade reading level one, that's like a viral headline that you can nice. use in the ads. Nice, Yeah, that's I like that a lot. Yeah, thank you. And uh, number one, uh, it, it, between the ads and the organic, what's higher, ads or organic, like on, on your acquisition? Uh, cost? Uh, no, no, no. What's, uh, what, which one brings you in more deals? Uh, right now, ads are... Barely outpacing it. Really? Yeah, it's like almost 50-50. Okay, and what's your typical cost per acquisition on the ads, do you know? Uh, it's around $600. Okay, and your, yeah. your, your things like multiple four figures, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, so that's a solid thing. Yeah. Why are you not spending like 10 times more money on ads right now? I'm about to start cranking it up. Got it. Yeah, we've been testing a lot of stuff, and honestly, the, the truth is like with our back end, it's – it's not the most scalable, scalable offer. Like if we just did a course or coaching, that would obviously be much more scalable. But one of our core values is like, how do we make this world class, right? And so we're willing to do a little bit of extra work to make it a little more manual to deliver excellent value. And so we had to build some serious back-end systems in there, build, hire some team members and stuff before we could really crank things up. It would have broken everything if I 
hit crank on that. So. Yeah, but the same thing yeah. just for also people that are listening yeah. right now, the same reason why ads are working well is because you're doing that amount of extra work in the back. Like if you're just like, oh, we teach you points, yeah. that's less sexy. Sure. But the the crazy thing is, is you may, and, and all granted, I have not seen your ads in your funnel, but most people, if they make the change that you do in order to increase fulfillment to where it's like world-class, that's amazing and that'll get you more referrals. But then the second step, which you may or may not have taken yet, is being able to translate that level of value in one single sentence and that's how you make the ads more effective. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like you could have the best thing in the world on the back end, but if you're explaining that to somebody when they get on the sales call, you're already missing out on a lot of business because in reality, the top of funnel ad should be the sure, thing that's sure. like, you know, hey, we'll book your flights, we'll take care of everything for you, you just sit back right. and show up to the You make airport. a bigger claim. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Make a, Exactly, make a bigger mm. claim. And then of course, follow it up. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Like, for sure. Dude, great, great podcast. Yeah. Really appreciate you coming on here. I, I took a bunch of notes. I learned a lot on here as well, so I hope they did as well. If somebody's listening to this right now and either A, they want to potentially work with you, maybe they're in that kind of realm, they're spending like 30 grand a month and they like want somebody to take care of the travel for them or maybe they're just like this dude sounds awesome and i want to see some of the travel that you do because you do have some really epic content you and tommy on instagram what's the best places that people can find you and learn more about you sure yeah so top two places number one is just going to be instagram eli travel guy it's eli travel guy and you can just shoot us a message there just say the word ravi we'll send you over some some free stuff give you some tips um and so that can start you off you can talk with our team through that channel and then otherwise you can check out our our main site, which is just freedomtravelsystems.com. I did not copy scalingwithsystems.com <laughs> and the colors aren't the same either. So freedomtravelsystems.com if you want to start maximizing more travel. Love it. All right, Jack, get the lawyer on the phone. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Eli, it was awesome to bring you, Likewise. man. I appreciate you. Thank you guys so much and we'll see you in the next episode.